Right. There's us. Okay. Here we go. I'm sure. I'm sure we've got this figured out. We do. We've we've done this just 590 times. Yeah, but everything's new now. <laughs> so uh, you're gonna you're gonna uh, you're gonna have to somehow just like wave to me or like you know go like this. Do you have the chat up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me pull up the chat and I'll put now in the chat. How does that sound? Sure. That sounds good. If you can remember, one of us has to remember. I mean, it's just, you know, I have 590 well-worn passages running through my brain. So I know, I know. Yeah. I'm asking you to to change your pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. And that is hard. Hard. It's going to be tough. Okay. But in theory, we're live. Hey, everybody. Okay. How's it going? Uh, so I've been I've been showing this off uh, on various live streams, and I thought I would just I would do this one more time. Well, actually, okay. I'll probably do this on open open space as well. So it's heavy. So I've got a big box here. Uh, lift with the knees now with the back. What what manner of is that a monitor? No, that's your Tesla thingy. No. That's that's your uh uh Skylink, Starlink. Starlink, that's the name of it. Yes, Starlink, I remembered. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> so you are going to be a beta tester for the richest man in the world. Exactly. <sighs> or uh more specifically, I'm going to have a uh, a backup source of internet um for for when you know when when our power goes out here so uh yeah and i'll just be able to test it out and i promise i will only use it for sharing pictures of astronomy <laughs> that's it that's the only You'll also use it to find pictures of sure astronomy. yeah i'll find pictures of astronomy but but i mean you know it's like it's like carbon offsets right you have to use starlink to help people explore space that's its only that's its only purpose um how's it going it's going well yeah. and and we have an announcement to share with our audience that may make this show just like every episode of the daily space this week a little more awkward as we're learning our way around something new yeah and and also this will be an announcement to me so hey well you, i have told you this multiple times mm. i have so, Tell everybody and I'll find okay. out as well. Okay. So um, I got a excellent phone call from our good friends at Now Media. One, I'm looking at you, uh, who let me know that they had just purchased a television station in Houston, <laughs> Texas, one of the largest media markets in the United States. And they want Astronomy Cast to be part of their lineup. So our little podcast that became a YouTube series is now ionizing one more time as we become a local market TV show for Houston and uh, will also be available on Roku and other platforms. And this means that we're going to have to change up our format a tiny bit. So I... Uh, I'm going to be trying to get Fraser to about every five to six minutes go to commercial break. Now, we don't actually have any commercial sponsors yet. Mm -hmm. So during our show, they're going to be showing all of the ads they have to show because they're a television station and there's things the FCC requires. But um, the hope is that eventually we can start to get television sponsors and that will allow us to up our production values. Our goal is to just constantly fold in to making things better and better for you. And um, this is where we start with a awkward recording where we're trying to talk about something we're super excited about and remember to pause every now and then. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so every five to six minutes you want me to do this how many times do you want me to do this 
there's there's going to be three stops altogether. Three stops. So roughly the on the ten minute marks. No, wait. Roughly no, no, the no. That only marks. gives. Yes. Sure. Okay. Around the eight minute mark, seven eight minute marks. Okay. And I will say some. What would you like me to say? Um, for those of you tuning in, this is Astronomy Cast. After the break, we will. Okay. Okay. For those of you tuning in, okay, <laughs> three times. And and our goal is to get Nancy, who due to having a sudden doctor's appointment yesterday, I wasn't able to train for today. I'm sorry, Nancy. Um, she's going to be doing the production in the background. And as we increase our production, um, she's going to be adding in media and things like right. that while we talk right right so okay so i'm gonna say like at some point you know that's really interesting and we'll get to that after the break or yes okay. exactly Perfect. that's the kind of thing you need to say sure that sounds good stay tuned for your th pamela's thrilling response okay no problem it's gonna be awkward folks oh yeah Oh, yes. So, um, yeah. And like we can always, I guess it's live television, so we can't. I, no, mean, I guess no, no. it's going to be edited. This is a getting bit. edited. Yeah. This is fine. getting okay. edited. So like I, I the other day Ooh. decided that while Beth was talking about Venus, I should show a picture of the moon. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, OK, we need to start that over and, well, and just pause. Na yeah. Nancy says, can we guys ad lib some fake commercials so we get the real experience? Yeah, I think that sounds great. This episode of Astronomy Cast is brought to you by the heat death of the universe. No matter how bad your life is today, you can't escape the inexorable death of everything. And now on to our show. That kind of thing. Right? I love that. Yeah. All right. Let us, uh, I'm going to say hi to some people. Hello to Andrew Planet, Eddie Cowley, Beth Johnson, Bart Clankar, Chad Weber. TPI 209, Hal McKinney, Ian Farquhar, Joel Bladden, Johnny Zed, Katrina Astro YYZ, Lionel L, Nancy Graziano, Paul Disney, Arjon, Ryan Schmitz, Sir Goosey, and I'm sure a bunch of you also said hello earlier on and I missed it. So I apologize. Um, right on. Okay. So for those for those of you wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, this <laughs> is going to be a, a live recording of Astronomy Cast, complete with awkward ad breaks. Uh, we will uh, record the show, and then we will stick around and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Is that going to be in the TV show too? No. Okay. Just the show show part. Yeah. Okay. Right on. You can okay. only make so much sausage. <laughs> All right. Um, let me know when you're ready and we will begin recording. Okay. So I am pressing go on the audio. It is recording. I am also recording. Hello, Rich. And I've got the right setup because I did, sh I do have a new monitor. And so it's, but, but I am recording on the right episode. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Mm -hmm. We're all good. Mm -hmm. We're good to go. I'm pressing oh. start. I'm not pressing start. Don't yet. What uh, happened? Should I restart uh, my audio? Yeah, you want to restart your audio in a second here. Um, yeah. So I moved a window and it decided to minimize every window on my screen. Oh, God. Yeah. Have you never had that happen? No, because I use a Mac. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, it happens. Um, okay. Okay. So I'm not going to move that window. I was going to move my little introduction in front of my eyes so it looked more professional. And uh, but in doing so, it, that was that was a bad mistake. Don't touch the edge of the window. It's kind of like, you know, that game operation. Like if you move your if you touch the edge of the window, every window on my entire computer just minimizes. And then I have to rebuild them all. OK. All right. Here we go. All right. I'm pressing record again. Uh, oh, wait, the, my, okay. I was recording, but the window that held my recording had minimized. Okay. All right. I've, I'm now pressing record. I've also pressed record. Here we go. Hello, Rich. Astronomy Cast, episode 590, Lunar Hazards, 
dust, radiation, and more. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I am doing great, and I am pleased to say hello to our new audience on Houston Channel 21, where we're on at 11 p.m. after the nightly news and the daily space. This is exciting. This is so cool. Hello, Houston. So if things are a little awkward, we are still learning our way around television, but don't you fear we're going to be here getting better every week as we work to bring you more and more science. Well, to be fair, um, this is episode 590 of our long running uh, Astronomy Cast show. We have done more seasons than I think either of us can even count. There are not numbers in the universe high enough to calculate how long we've been doing this show. So while we may be new to television, we are definitely not new to Astronomy Cast, and we will do our best to adapt Astronomy Cast to this television that you're <laughs> watching this on right now. It's like the internet, and, I think. And like everyone on television right now, we are recording this from our homes. I am in Southern Illinois, where I realized as we went to record, my Halloween and Christmas combined decorations are still on my wall. How about you, Fraser? Uh, I'm on Vancouver Island, Canada. Uh, of course, the heart of space journalism here at the headquarters of Universe Today. And um, today we're going to take you off of this world and bring you a story of dust and radiation and danger, death. danger and fear. Uh, well, 2024 can't come soon enough. You know, that's the year when humans will set foot on the moon again. Now, don't you roll your eyes. That's the plan, well, unless the plan changes. But my point is, explorers going to the moon will need to be concerned about all kinds of hazards like dust, radiation, and gigantic moonworms, I believe. Uh, all right, Pamela, uh, the moon uh, already sounds like a scary place to me. Well, and in general, our universe is trying to kill us. <laughs> As always, sometimes again. actively, yeah, sometimes passively. But it's it's full of things that here on Earth we are protected largely by our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So in going to the moon, as we learn from the Apollo astronauts, we need to worry about everything from dust to radiation to falling rocks and uh, even our eyes playing tricks on us. All right. So what so when the humans when the humans set foot on the moon 2024, uh, probably. Obviously, you know, schedule change will keep you updated. Um, but let's say they do. What Let's break down some of these hazards. I mean, obviously, you know, they're going to have some familiar things like gravity, some gravity. Um, they're going to be encased in a spacesuit, so they'll be bringing some kind of atmosphere with them. The spacesuit will keep them warm, so they won't freeze to death. The spacesuit will keep them cool, so they won't uh, boil to death. But uh, there are some things that will be uh, different kinds of dangers than what we face here on Earth. So let's talk about the radiation first. So here on Earth, we have a magnetic field that allows us to find our way around with compasses and generates amazing northern lights, southern lights, the, the aurora when solar flares interact with the magnetic field. And that magnetic field is, in general, providing breaks for any high-energy particles headed our way. These particles get their directions changed, get their velocities changed, and... Altogether, we aren't experience, experiencing what's called ionizing radiation. This is the kind of radiation that if it hits your DNA, it's going to snap that DNA apart and uh, cause cancer. It's also, mm. in fact, so unnerving that it will literally cause flashes to be seen in your closed eyes. I've this heard that. Something... Yeah. yeah, I've heard I've heard astronauts talk about that, that they close their eyes while they're in like the space station or when they were in the Apollo missions and they would see these flashes and the flashes were cosmic rays busting through their retinas, which is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can literally see how the universe is trying to kill you passively. 
So did you know that when you're standing on the surface of the moon, you're experiencing 200 times more radiation than when you're on the surface of the earth. So it is and, a lot more radiation. And here on the earth are OSHA, the, the organization in the US government that protects people from bad work environments, <laughs> had to actually change the guidelines right. so that astronauts are exempted from the radiation levels that all other people are expected to be protected from. Oh, that's 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 rich. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's no way to make working on the moon a safe environment, uh, which we're about to, uh, you know, continue uh, going deeper into. Um, OK, so so what can we do about that radiation? Well, different kinds of radiation can be blocked in different ways. And one of the most protective barriers that we can do is just a simple layer of water. Unfortunately, putting a barrier of water between you and outer space is going to weigh a lot. Anyone who has ever had to carry around a gallon of water knows you're looking at a heavy amount of water. Now imagine instead surrounding yourself with gallon upon gallon upon gallon of water. That's a lot to carry to the moon, but we're going to need water anyway. So this isn't a completely unrealistic but what about idea. Dirt? It's just awkward. Yeah. So dirt is another option. The moon has, as we've discussed in past episodes that you can find on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and wherever you find podcasts. Um, we have discovered that uh, you can just become the mole man, mole woman of the moon right. and live in tunnels that were left over from lava tubes. And that will protect you from some of this radiation. I, I don't know if you ever read the book Seven Eves by Neil I Stevenson. Did. Yeah. And so they talk about that, that that when the when people get to the moon to set up shop, they find a cavern on the moon that is still expo exposed to space and they set up their they set up their base down at the bottom of this of this valley and so that protects them from most of the radiation it would have to be only radiation that's coming straight down from overhead will actually impact them everything else is going to come in at an angle it's going to hit the sides of the valley and they're going to be protected from it so you can sort of play a numbers game you don't have to live in a tunnel you just have to live far enough down with steep enough walls around you that that you're going to be able to minimize that kind of impact. But I mean, I think for a lot of people, if they went to the knowing that you're experiencing just this constant bathing radiation is unnerving, but it's not going to it's the kind of problem that future you 40 years down the road is going to have to face. Uh, there are more uh, dangers that lurk uh, more immediately. And we'll get to that in a second after the break. Uh, this episode of Astronomy Cast is brought to you by horrible choking atmospheric, no, sorry, uh, lunar regolith dust, asbestos on another planet. All right, let's talk about, uh, all right. All right, before that, well, so we do this again. Right, before we went into the break, I was t preparing people to wrap their minds around another fearful danger on the surface of the moon, and that's dust. So here on Earth, our dust is, as creepy as it may sound, majority made of things like skin, <laughs> uh, Flex deteriorating from the plaster in your room, bits of dirt thrown up into the air. When you're sweeping your house, you're just sweeping pieces of your family and dog up. Yeah. Ugh. And then there's all Gross, the dust but mites not that, that live dangerous. off the dust. Yeah. <laughs> so, so our dust is of the soft and squishy variety that is gross, but won't generally kill you. You're just like haunting my dreams now, right? Our dust <laughs> is skin cells, bits of hair, fluff, and dust mites. That's like dust on earth and dust on the moon could not be any different. No. So, so on the moon, what we're dealing with is small pieces of essentially glass. The surface of the moon is uh, covered in what's called regolith. This is 
various lunar minerals that have been broken down into the size of dust by impact after impact after impact of asteroids and meteorites falling from space. There's no rain to round the edges on these little tiny shards. There is no buffering of them against each other to round them down. Instead, you just have itty bitty little tiny shards that are small enough to be breathed and smell like gunpowder, according to the Apollo astronauts. And after exposure of just 22 hours, astronaut Harrison Schmidt declared he had a version of hay fever due to moon dust irritating his lungs and sinuses. And, and we don't know what the long-term effects of this are going to be. I, I don't think any of the astronauts, when they came back to Earth, experienced any increased incidence of like lung cancer, things like that, which you see with, with things like asbestos. But asbestos is a really close analog to what we're looking at. Tiny pieces of little glass shards with almost like hooks in it that really want to dig into your lung tissue and stick around for a while, literally. And this is one of those things where we don't have a lot of experience with how dust acts in this kind of environment. The 12 Apollo astronauts that were on the moon altogether were only there for 80 hours. And during that time, it was long enough for them to be miserable, but not so long as to generate these permanent health hazards. There was an increased risk of cancer that we've seen with the astronauts from the radiation. Mm -hmm. but Which we mentioned earlier, yeah. Right. But, but the dust, this is a problem that's new. And it's, it's new not just because of the sharpness that we're having to deal with, but also the ability of dust to stay in the air. Here on Earth, when you're sweeping, the, the dust that gets tossed up that you can see in sunbeams, it is getting slowed with its interactions with the atmosphere. So it doesn't go very far. Right, right. There's no atmosphere on the moon. Well, I, want, I do want to talk about that, but I, I feel like we're not quite finished talking about that, that dust. Because we talked about the, duck, the dust getting into your lungs, but yeah. it actually gets everywhere. Like, it's not just going to be a problem for your lungs. It's going to be a problem for machinery, for equipment, things that connect together, things that turn and move. You've got, it's like, imagine you're taking, you're, you're just dumping just glass into everything. And the stuff's like electrostatically charged and so it stays around. It wrecked the seals on some of the moon rock containers that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts because they couldn't get the dust to not be in the seals. And if you've ever seen dirt build up on the seals to your refrigerator and then looked at your electric bill, you know that having grime in the seal makes it less effective. Well, with moon rocks, it doesn't just pack in there it also wrecks the surface like sandpaper while it gets in there this means it gets really really hard to have a perfect seal between something exposed to the outer environment of the moon and the inside of your spacecraft and the containment vessels for any samples we bring back to earth but i mean imagine like a lunar rover or some kind of machine that's designed to go it's going to have bearings and turny parts and 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 there's going to be hose clamps they're going to be attaching and 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 removing uh, batteries and electrical equipment and all this kind of stuff again and again all the time and it's just going to be this dust apparently really gets around it gets into all of it it's so tiny and so abrasive that it's going to almost instantly wear down everything so what can we do about this dust? So we're still trying to figure this out. One of the first things that they're working to do is in designing the new spacesuits that will be used on the moon. They're making it so that you don't put them on inside and then go in and out and in the airlock. Instead, they're making it so you slide down into your spacesuit, pull your arms down, latch up your head, 
And now the only thing that is between you, your spacecraft, and the outside world is a single seal right. that's part of your spacesuit, part of how you close up your helmet. When you get out, you basically have to pull your arms back in and then reach up and pull yourself out. But with lower gravity, this isn't that terrible. And they've actually been practicing this out in the Nevada desert. And would-be astronauts have been able to do this even under Earth gravity. So changing how we get in and out of the lunar environment is one of the first things that we're looking at. The second thing that's being looked at is when spacecraft are landing or anyone is tearing around on the surface of the moon, just like a galloping horse will stir up dust here on Earth, a landing rocket or a dune buggy on full speed ahead is going to stir up dust. So we're trying to figure out technologies that will allow us to not necessarily melt, but to what's called center the moon dust and right. the moon rocks so that it forms a compact surface that doesn't throw up dust. So instead of the effects of a dune buggy going across sand, it will be more like just a car going down the highway without throwing material up into the air. Right. This is actually work that's being done by one of our friends, Phil Metzger, down mm -hmm. at Central Florida University. And the good news is that the dust that's on the moon has taken billions of years to get there. And so if you do center some, I don't know, if, like imagine like creating a big concrete pad that you have that you have made out of lunar dust that is now dust free. Uh, you're not going to get any new dust falling on this region very rapidly. And so it's not going to be so you're going to essentially clear a region of the moon that is safe to work within, you're going to minimize all the dust, literally a broom will be your friend to keep this area clean. And then as long as you're working within this space, you won't be able to, you won't have to deal with the with the lunar dust. But also it's, you know, the fact that it is electrostatically charged is a benefit as well, because you can run an electrical field and try to make the stuff get repelled. So this is our new way forward, we have to mitigate dust by kind of sort of almost melting it, <laughs> melting it, but and then charging it. But there are still more ways the moon is going to try and kill us. And we'll talk about those when we're right back. All right. Okay, so whatever you're gonna do. Oh, yeah, like a like another another sponsor. <laughs> this, <laughs> this episode of astronomy cast is sponsored by no. Um, all right. So we talked about the dust that's just collecting on the surface, but there are hazards in space. And actually, that dust is still a problem in space itself. When a rocket is going to be landing on the moon, it's going to be kicking up so much dust that it will cause a problem for future missions going to the moon. Can you talk about this? So you had hinted earlier that the dust on the moon is electrostatically charged. And what this means is these particles have either elect extra electrons or too few electrons on them. And when they go to come together, they get repelled. And this is enough force that gravity isn't nearly as effective as you would expect at causing the dust to fall back down to the lunar surface. And since the gravity is already significantly less than we have here on Earth, that dust is able to stay suspended for a long time. And because there's no atmosphere to slow it down when it's accelerated, it gets lofted to great distances above the surface. This is something we've actually been able to see with some spacecraft, the LADEE mission. It was able to see how dust got stirred up in the atmosphere from impacts of meteorites. So we're getting dust at spacecraft orbital elevations. Right. From falling rocks. Right. From falling rocks. Not to mention when very powerful rockets, like when, for example, when the Artemis missions happen and the lander comes down to the surface of the moon, it's going to be firing its rockets. It's going to be propulsively slowing itself down. The blast from those rockets is going to be kicking up dust into orbital trajectories. And so now you've kicked up this glass debris and it's now orbiting around the moon and any future rockets 
are going to have a problem because they're going to now get impacted by this literally sandpaper that they're moving through. And you, you mentioned Phil, Phil Metzger, he talked about it down near the surface. And also, he's calculated the danger that that future rockets will have. And so literally, until they center that landscape, until they they make safe landing pads, just landing on the surface of the moon, like the Apollo missions did, will mean that that nobody else will be able to follow you for for a certain amount of time until that dust all impacts the surface again and gets and gets cleared out again. So there, there's a practical limit to how many spacecraft can go to the surface of the moon while this dust is being kicked up. And again, we are looking at ways to mitigate this. One of the easiest ways to mitigate this is to essentially take an entire crater, center the surface of the crater, and land inside the crater. Now, the reason you do this in a crater is twofold. Uh, on one hand, you have the walls of the crater act as a shield for any dust you don't successfully center to the surface. And the other is it just gives you a nice easy surface to aim for with your rocket. Right. So you like that flat bottom that it exists and you like the walls that present prevent things from going too far away. Right, right, right. And so you've got this situation, you've got your the first like one of the the top priorities is to build a landing pad and to bring a broom in in a in a crater and then build your landing pad, keep it clean and then future rockets won't be kicking up this this dust. Uh, so we've talked about dust coming from the surface that you brought there. Um, let's talk about falling rocks after this break. Perfect, thank you. Yay! No problem, I can be taught. <laughs> and that was the last break we yeah. needed. Yeah. Cool, okay. All right, let's, let's talk about continue. falling rocks. All right, okay. When you look at the surface of the moon, you can see that it has been through some rough times. There are a lot of craters, big and small. When you think that there are uh, meters and meters of this churned up lunar regolith, that was caused by rocks falling from the sky. Is that a serious threat to people on the surface of the moon? It is. And, and for the most part, when we're looking at the moon, we're seeing a history of impacts that have occurred over the past for some odd billion years. But craters are still getting formed. And in fact, there were everyday people who back in January of 2019, during a lunar eclipse, saw in that darkened part of the moon a bright flash of light. We saw that, it. We captured yeah, it during it, our live stream of the of the eclipse. And and this was bright enough that we could see the energy of impact here on Earth. And while the astronaut spacesuits are designed to withstand a 90 millimeter round, which is pretty big, um, the problem we run into is micrometeorites can come both at higher velocities than those bullets and in larger masses than those bullets. And in both those scenarios, you're going to have a whole lot more energy than that it might have and that can go through a spacesuit which is bad it can also potentially go through your habitat right um so we're going to have to figure out not just how to shield the astronauts from radiation which has a different kind of high energy but also from the impact of rocks and also our own debris the more we're going to and from the moon the more junk we're going to end up accidentally throwing at ourselves as we currently do with the international space station but when you think about the international space station a lot of that debris is earth caused it's it's our space junk it's little bits yes. of flecks of paint it's little pieces of it's gloves that were left outside and, and hammers and things like that. And there are I mean, you can absolutely see when you look at the, the the you could see the pictures of the screen of the space shuttle, and you could see all the nicks and dents from it going through space debris. And there are puncture holes in the International Space Station's solar panels that show that it is still a very active environment. It's actually not as bad out at the moon because there isn't all that human debris in that same region. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yet. <laughs> right. Oh, 
the, the victims of our own success. But, but like, the chances are really low of, of you actually getting hit by a piece of rock from space, right? Like, that's the bad The chances luck. are exceedingly low. But this is one of those things where you have to build it into your system. There's certain things that probability is low and you design for it. So, for instance, one thing I learned prepping for this show is there are earthquakes as strong as fifth magnitude on the moon. And so when they're building space habitats, they're going to have to design them to survive earthquakes, even though the probability of that large an earthquake happening in the exact location where the astronauts are is extremely low. But low is not zero. And mm -hmm. killing people is a bad thing, mm -hmm. usually. Yeah, can confirm. Yeah. And, and so we are trying to build to keep people safe. We're trying to build to keep equipment, technology, experiments, and most of all, people safe. So this means we design for falling rocks and earthquakes. Right. But I mean, isn't just like there's, there is no design for falling rock. There is no design for a for a chunk of space rock or metal flying at you at 10,000 kilometers an hour. There's there, no mitigation of that. You just to have a to... certain point. Yeah. There, there's ways to make things less harmful. And we see this with the International Space Station and with plans by companies like Bigelow. And what they do is instead of building a single thick wall where you have to worry about punching through, worrying about cracks in this one structure, things are instead made in layer upon layer upon layer so that a rock coming through, meteorite, it will puncture through the different layers and each time gets slowed down and hopefully leave enough layers completely undamaged that you can just go out and patch the part that was a problem. Right. Duct tape is actually an important thing in outer space. And the other layers are there keeping you safe. And so by using this kind of a baffling system, we can build smarter, build better. Other ways are, again, build underground and make sure that what above you includes sandy soils that are better at absorbing impacts instead of collapsing on top of you. Right. But you're just going to go with blind luck while you're out on the surface of the moon. But for, I mean, for the radiation purposes and the dust purposes, you're going to want to minimize the amount of time that you spend out on the surface anyway. So just get used to being underground. And robots. Robots yeah. are our new arms, eyes, hands. And there's actually now a Boston Dynamics dog being trained for future right. exploration in space. So our uh, robot rovers are going to be our investigators digging up the surfaces of other worlds, safe from the things that would kill us. Yeah, when you saw those dancing Boston Dynamics robots, you kind of imagine them being teleoperated by human beings and being able to explore around on the surface of the moon, largely safe from the radiation, although still, I guess a meteorite strike would be a bad day for a robot. All right. Well, thank you, Pamela. Um, do you have some names for us this week? I do. And, and Rich, this part doesn't go out to TV, but I'm going to edit this week, so you don't need to know that. Um, so, sorry. Talking, thinking all at once is hard. All right. So we are, as always, supported through Patreon. You and your generous donations allow us to hire our audio and video editors, to pay our server costs, to not have to do our own budgeting. Everything goes through the Planetary Science Institute. And this allows us to focus on just bringing you the science, which is really what we want to do. So, so many thanks to all of you. And today I would like to specifically thank Catherine McCabe, Jordan Young, Burry Gowan, Berko, Roland, Andrew Palestra, Brian Cagle, David Trogue, Jeanette Wink, Aurora Leiper, Joe Hook, David, ACUT patron, Venkasha Chari, the giant nothing, Dan Lightman, Laura Kettleson, Robert Plasma, William, Joe Holstein, Joe Cunningham, Les Howard, Paul Jarman, 
Adam, Anise Brown, Emily Patterson, Ed loves science, um, Kasaref, Just Joe, Helga Borkyag, Frank Trippin, William Backer, and Gordon Dewis. Thank you all so much. And I just want to say we were trying to find 60 new patrons across all of our CosmoQuest projects. And because of you, we succeeded in doing that. And this is going to allow so much science to be done. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Stop that recording. Do you want me to stop the Zoom recording as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hope it went somewhere useful. I'll have to find <laughs> it. I don't know where it went. I've never done that before. I should record on... Normally, I record on OBS. Yeah. Like I said, I just wanted the raw that I can play with. Yeah, the raw you. Because it's not me. It's only you. No, it will have recorded both of us. Okay. With a different camera for me. Oh, that will be fascinating. Uh-oh. What? My, my audacity is hanging. Okay, just cancel. Okay. All right. So it sounds like my... That's scary. All right. All right, and I will export. Okay. And now I can sit back and be comfortable. Oh no. No, not after the, just the torrent of brutal questions come your way. Here we go. I can be comfortable while ask, answering brutal questions. Hmm. Chat chosen. Yes. Go. Hmm. So, What's Nancy, wrong? did you click the buttons during this episode or not? Because I don't think they got pulled into the database. So I'll pull them from the chat instead. Okay. With tag. No, it looks like they weren't brought in. That's too bad. Okay. We have to fix this bug. Okay. Time of dying, zero, zero. Why are we even talking about living on the moon in the first place? I thought gravity wells were for suckers. Um, it's sort of like, why do we bother trying to live in Antarctica? Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's it's, talk about the hazards of Antarctica. <laughs> Killer penguins. There's all kinds of problems. <laughs> right. It's um, so, so minor rabbit hole. One of my favorite genres of scientists randomly sharing is the, we're not supposed to approach the penguins, but they won't leave us alone posts that you get from folks working down in Antarctica. There, there are a few cases even of like the scientists going out on a hike to get data and a penguin follows them, just right. keeping up with them. Um, anyways, that's one of my favorite genres of science tweet. Yeah. Um, so there, there's no good reason to be trying to live in Antarctica. It is trying to kill us yeah. quite a yeah. lot. Even and less yes. good reasons to live on the moon and Mars. And and we do it for science. Mm -hmm. Now, the other place that we go for science is under the ocean. And quite honestly, deep sea is far more hazardous a place to go to than outer space. Um, but is the, it the pressures pushing in on your spacecraft that you have to worry about your, not spacecraft, your submarine imploding. Yeah. Combined with far. the need to get the right mixture of nitrogen oxygen in the environment. And they start mixing in things with helium at the super high pressures. Um, yeah, underwater is bad and it's extremely cold. Yeah, so, but it's not far. Like, I think you've got the problem of being at the. It'd be interesting. I would love to see a debate which is more dangerous. But I think. You die yeah. if you come out of the depths of the ocean too fast sure. from the bends. 
coming down from space, you run the you run the in jeopardy of burning up if you don't pitch your angle correctly. But as long as you get the angle right, you're good. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I think though it'd be interesting to see the debate that. The, yeah. But but the point I think is is that being at the top of Mount Everest is not a habitable place. They literally mm. call it the death zone. You get above 8,000 yeah. meters and you're in the death zone. Yeah. So uh, same thing with if you're living on the moon or you're living on Mars, you're living at the bottom of the ocean, you're living in Antarctica, you are in the death zone. You only exist because of an enormous stack of technology that is keeping you alive and constant supply. And the second any of that runs out, death is, is nearly instantaneous. And, and for those who think that, that living on the moon or living on Mars is going to be just like buying a ranch in Arizona, it is not. It is, it is a horrible, dangerous, dangerous place. So, yeah. Um, but, but the, we need to go. We need to set up, yes. a, we need to set up a research station. There needs, needs to be, there needs to be a astronauts at the space station astronauts on the moon astronauts on mars i can't wait and and but we just have to appreciate how close how badly those places are trying to kill them all the time yeah how badly mars just wants to get into their space to just kill them all right Um, um, Hal McKinney asks, when will Astronomy Cast or Weekly Space Hangout interview someone that's live from space? I can't wait. That is hard to get permission to do. Also, there's a delay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've, I've never been able to interview somebody live from space at the time. I had one of my questions answered by Chris Hadfield while he was on the space station about That's photography. Cool. I've, of course, talked to lots of astronauts after the fact. Yeah. Um, but I've never... Don Pettit is one of the oh, nicest yeah. humans. Yeah, well, we mentioned this. Yeah, he was he was at a conference and we had breakfast together and we just just yacked for an hour and a half. And we just we were just talking and just more and more people were showing up and gathering around and like participating in the conversation. Yeah, if you can ever have a conversation, if you, if like if you could choose one astronaut to interview, go for Don Pettit. He's a he's a champion. Um, Stella just decided just figured out that she can't get to me and she's squeaking in the background. This is the time in the episode when normally I get floofed. Today um, I closed the door. <laughs> nice one. Uh, Broken Symmetry asks, isn't Mars dust softer than moon dust due to atmospheric conditions and storms? Mars is, yeah. Mars is, it yeah. Is, it has, there's an atmosphere, there is water. It's, yeah, it's way better. Yeah, Mars has wind to just yeah. push it the particles it. around and tumble it around and make it. So it, that hazard is non-existent on Mars in the way that it is. Although it is toxic on Mars. I guess this is another video, isn't it? Another episode. Because <laughs> the Mars dust is poisonous. So as opposed to choking your lungs, it merely poisons your body. Anyway. <laughs> um, Arjun asks, do you need GPS on the moon? Like, would that be at all useful? Especially yes. on the poles or far side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the things that astronauts found broke their brains a bit with getting around on Mars, not on Mars, on the moon. And uh, we didn't get to this in our episode, but we hinted at it was um, because there's no atmosphere, that hazing of more and more distant objects that we have here on Earth, we can tell when a mountain range is very far off because the intervening air makes that mountain range look fuzzy on the moon they don't have that mm -hmm. so you can't judge based on crispness how far away something is and everything is more or less equally sharp edged in a very fractal kind of way because of the formation via collision and then because shadows are so much starker you don't get the same scattered light 
and everything is basically white and black with shades of gray in between, astronauts just can't differentiate between different surfaces to the point that one of the Apollo missions was trying to find a safe way to drive their buggy down into a crater and they couldn't see it with their eyeballs. <laughs> and NASA was looking and, and was like, look, there's this 21 degree safe path down over here. And the astronauts just couldn't see it. Wow. Yeah. It really messes with your brain, not having air. Right. The, the just that stark regions, stuff that's in sunlight and stuff that's in shadow is astonishingly bright and deeply black and to yeah. be able to distinguish you know your eyes even your eyes don't have the dynamic range to be able to to pick off the differences that's really uh it's really interesting i mean there's there's even minor things we didn't even talk about things about like you know you see the videos of the astronauts tumbling around while they're trying to walk on the moon they're falling over because they're just they're not accustomed to being able to walk on the surface of the moon yeah. and you can imagine weird as it may seem that you, you because we evolved to exist in this gravity and then you're in this 15 percent gravity and you're just like walking around and then suddenly you trip and you go and you trip over a railing or you trip in just in a you know in a very dangerous way so i can imagine yeah. it being a problem Um, let's see. Uh, Larry's asking if I got a new gravity or gravity wells for suckers poster. No, no, it's just, I, uh, I've got a new monitor. And so the camera's a little different where it's positioned. Maybe that's it. Michael Harmer, the ad intervals are interesting to watch. How does it feel switching your method of broadcasting? I broke Fraser. I am of the opinion that that we what's important is that we need to keep the show. Yeah. So if they want to adapt the show to television, that sounds great. But but I think fundamentally we're not going to adapt what we do to television. I think that's its charm. So uh, I think television needs to adapt to us. <laughs> we so, still need to put breaks in. Yeah, no, fine. Absolutely. I'm just saying. <laughs> that that just what that that what television like the what the internet allowed us to do is have this deep c community and connection with the audience yeah. and the ability to respond to people and the ability to to build a narrative week after week after week we don't need to i don't think i don't think we need to like try to just make it we don't, we don't need to change what we do except no. for the occasional commercial break that's all yeah and and the only Thing that I'm going to try and do with the editing is something that Fraser's been trying to figure out how to do for ages. And this is something we'd be doing whether or not we were going to television. And this is trying to figure out how to get in illustrations of what we're talking about on screen. Right. And this is something that we've been doing with the daily space. Um, and, and I want to bring all those lessons learned from doing the daily space over to astronomy cast because we are talking about a very visual field and I want to be able to share the beauty mm -hmm. and the horror and the starkness <laughs> all on the show with you. Are you, when you guys are doing daily space, are you actually showing images live or are you doing, mm -hmm. are you editing them in afterwards? No, we're doing it all live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I do, you know, when I'm, when, when I'm engineering the shows is just, just bringing in pictures live. The key is it's, it's hard to do a whole bunch of things all at the same time. And that's why it's so right. great to have an engineer behind the scenes who's actually running a bunch of stuff. So you just focus on being, on doing your part of the big picture. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to crack it too. Yeah. Um, so Andrew Planet asks, would a water shower on the moon get rid of the dust on spacesuits? Uh, so the issue is that the water sublimates as soon as it's exposed to vacuum. So you'd have to bring the spacesuits inside to right. wash them. And water is a valuable commodity. And filtering out little shards of glassy substance would be very hard on your filtering system. So there's probably a whole lot of it would work, but it's a terrible idea kind of things. Yeah. And you'll be bringing the enemy inside. Yeah. And you don't want to do that. No. Keep the enemy outside. Yeah. 
Yeah, you need this, that this... dust must never come inside your your space station, your your colony. This, this is reminding me of a time when I fell off of a horse so badly that my trainer looked at me and said that she was going to hose me off with the garden hose before I was allowed inside anywhere, and she did. Right. Arjone asks, how far could an astronaut walk on the moon if they had to? Um, it's, it's harder to get around on the moon just because we aren't, like, naturally used to walking correctly so you'd on one hand get tired faster but on the other hand with every stride you can cover a larger distance yeah. so if push came to shove and you were somewhere flat enough the craters on the moon are amazingly deep they can be kilometers deep if you were somewhere with the distances were easy to travel you could probably make it tens of kilometers mm -hmm. per day mm -hmm. um just like you could here on earth where the real limiting factor is going to be how much air can you take in your spacesuit and that's something technology can't tell us yet yeah when they when they did the missions when they did the apollo missions and they had those lunar cars when they yes. were driving around on the surface of the moon this was one of the issues was how far do we let the astronauts go from the from the landing site on this vehicle that could break down and then they yeah. could be stranded and so that was really the limiting factor of how far they were able to travel and i think they didn't go beyond about five kilometers i forget the exact number which was they they had estimated essentially a maximum distance that it was safe to let the astronauts get to where they could be expected to be able to make a return walk if their car broke down and and, and the astronauts broke the rules once because they saw a cool rock cool they wanted rock. to go collect right yeah uh, which of course eventually that just gets you killed so yeah. no cool rocks um cool okay well we've reached the end of our of our hour um what's coming up over the next few days for good folks at cosmoquest uh, so next week is the American Astronomical Society meeting, and I suspect both of us are going to be mm -hmm. basically doing deep dives through all the new science coming Wait, so out. So I'm going to have to sit at my computer and look at science press releases for day yes. after day after day. That's what's going to be happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's different from my normal job, but I'm, <laughs> I'm ready for it. But I, I don't know if you noticed, but like this week, there has been so little news coming out. And part of that is because it's yes. the beginning of the semester, it's the end of the holidays, but also next week is double AS. So a lot of people are sitting on yeah. stuff at the meeting. I, I actually, I, I didn't send out my newsletter for the last two weeks and I thought, okay, it'll be actually pretty easy. Turns out there's a, actually a lot of news. I've been writing and writing Just and writing. Just not this week. Not this, no, not this week, but no, there were, there was some news. And so it's, yeah. it had accumulated. And so actually today's newsletter, when I finish it, uh, will be the biggest one I've ever done. It's going to be a monster. It's going to be because it's three weeks of news in one episode. Uh, my fingers are tired. <laughs> <laughs> my brain is exhausted. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're going to be bringing you science from the American Astronomical Society meeting and um, keeping on trying to perfect how to bring you more science better. A year ago, we were in Hawaii I know. For the previous Astronomical Society meeting, aware of the oncoming coronavirus. Yeah. I remember of... talking about it with yeah. you and Sandlin and Matthew and Chad Yep. as as we all hung out in the hotel room that my husband and I had, drinking and who, plowing who... through mangoes like our lives depended on it. Who who would believe? Who would know that? That we would that would be like the last time we get a chance to leave our houses for a year. But I have to say, if our last trip is one that brought us together and allowed us to do it in Hawaii, we can't really complain. No, no, um, it's it's been fine. It's been fine. Although we did have to cancel our trip to Japan. Yeah, which that's sucked. that's. You're gonna have to take your son there someday. It's I know. an amazing I, yeah, country. I promise. I will. I will. Cool. Well, we've got, uh, what have I got coming up? Nothing super interesting. Uh, new episode of Open Space. We're going to try and do a virtual star party on the weekend, but you know how that works. 
And, I do. and then, of course, we will be full court press next week for the American Astronomical Society meeting. Lots of interesting news. We will be bringing as much that of that to you as we can with uh, with the universe today. So, so buckle up, everybody. Next week is going to be a busy one. That sounds great. And until then, um, I'm going to actually try and take down some of my Christmas decorations. <laughs> and Halloween decorations. And Halloween <laughs> decorations. So if all goes well, next time we're together, there will be a painting here instead of um, Fritz. And I his don't ring. think that dragon should ever leave. So I may keep the dragon, but there will be a painting instead of the the balls. Whatever. I know that I speak for our entire audience to say that that dragon behind you is one of the best parts of your set. Don't ever thank remove you. it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our moderators. Thanks to Nancy Graziano, as always, uh, for keeping everything organized. Really appreciate it. And Thanks on the watching. straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody, both on YouTube and on Twitch. We know you're there. And we will see and, and all the new fans who found their way from television. And we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Okay.